Hello, my lovely viewers, and welcome. I am Kira, a romantic ace, and tonight we are streaming Chapter 9 of Endless Summer, Book 2. If you haven't joined me before, welcome! I drink and I cuss! If you want to play the drinking game along with me, the rules are right here on the screen, also below the player at twitch.tv slash aromanticace. If you cannot read the words in either spot, go to that website, click on the graphic, and it will take you to my Wattpad, where you can read the most recent version of the drinking game rules in text form. Also, if you haven't joined me before, the story so far, so we are playing as Kira, a college co-ed who won an all-expenses-paid trip to a private island in the Caribbean. However, when we got there, we realized there was no one else on the island. Um, no staff at the hotel, no one in the uh, air traffic control tower, although there was someone around to torch our plane. And the yachts in the marina when we tried to leave. Hmm. Uh, it also turns out this island is populated by, and, and this is by no means exhaustive, a, like, butterfly wing seahorse fairy. A frost-breathing fox, a saber-toothed tiger, pirates, and the Navi. I, I mean, the Vanti, whatever, uh, the Watchers, who were our adversaries, but now they're not because they think we're the, the like, fixtures of their religion or something. I don't know. I don't know. It's weird, y'all. It's weird, y'all. But we've been hanging out with them. We fought a giant sea monster together, like you do. And uh, last episode, our friend got possessed by the island's heart. And, and oh, we, we got contacted by uh, the island's uh, digital assistant, I guess. Um... Who, who has a couple of shocking revelations for us. Um, one of them is that she might be able to get us off the island. The other one is that she's apparently the mother of one of our friends. I, I don't know how that works, but, you know, not, not judging out loud. <laughs> right? So, so with that, with that, the, uh, the stinger for chapter 9 is a former ally discloses surprising secrets. The road home stretches out before you, but can you survive the journey? Let's find out! So this is Act 5, Chapter 9. Toward a new horizon. Still in and around Elistel, the the Vanti village. You, Zara, and Alistair gather around Iris's hologram. Your blue face or your face is illuminated by its blue glow. I mean they're blue now anyway. I know you were very young, Alistair, but do you not even recognize my voice? I... your voice is... Iris closes her eyes and begins to sing. Oh, oh, good lord. They're gonna make me do it, huh? Um, hmm. Uh, okay. I told my love a story with no end. I gave my love a baby with no crying. And then... Mother? Wow, that, that was all it took, huh? Okay. It's... it's you. Hold up. What in the name of Fork Exec is going on here? 
You see, I was human once. My name was Imogen. Everett was my husband, and Alistair was my son. Why didn't you tell us any of this? I didn't have access to memories of my former life until very recently. Had I known before, I'd have... The hologram stutters erratically. Iris seems to be struggling to maintain her composure. Iris? You okay? I don't have much time. I need to tell you how to access the Lernian Gate. Lernian Gate. Do you recall the device you used on the rooftop of the Celestial? Y yeah, the portal gun? That gun was an experimental prototype of a far more powerful machine. The Lernian Gate is an advanced prismatic hyperpermeator housed at a facility to the north. Advanced pri- but what? <sighs> prismatic hyperpermeator, pay attention. Sure, act like you've heard of this before, Zara. It can safely transport all of you home, or to another location, should you wish. You will need to bring the large prism that was activated at the hostile stronghold last night. Uh-oh. About that! The island's heart? How did you know we- I detected energy levels consistent with the presence of a major crystalline lattice in your vicinity. Um. Okay, that's that's not how, how crystal lattices work, but okay. <sighs> Sounds about right. The Lanian Gate requires a power source of incredible magnitude. The... Island's heart, as you call it, should be sufficient. Bring the prism to the Masada facility, approximately one quarter mile off the tip of the northern peninsula. I can promise you that there, once and for all, you'll finally be able to leave La Huerta behind. Oh, well, you know, we're, we're reasonably surprised by that. You know, this is something that I would generally expect from that kind of news. You know, just bring a giant crystal to this facility you've never heard of on the other side of the island and, you know, get, get home. I get, I don't know. That's, I'm, that's weird, but whatever. So we can say, but aren't you on work side now? Or... You'll come through the portal too, right? Um... I mean... She's she's kind of our friend. I would kind of... I mean, plus she's Alistair's mom, so... You'll come through the portal too, right? Yes, you must come. That would only be prudent. Okay, Alistair. Oh, I... Well, I'd certainly like to. You've gotta be kidding. You want her to come with us? After what she did? She didn't really do much, Zara. She just obeyed orders. And not by choice. So, yeah. Everett activated a part of my programming that it prevents me from acting against him. However, I choose to see your departure from La Huerta as beneficial to all involved parties. Yeah, that sounds legit. 
so you can't come with us? What if we kidnap you? What if we just grab you and drag you through the portal? Then what does Everett have to say about things? I cannot. And that's... that's it? You're all that's left of my mother and I'm never seeing you again? I can't tell you how sorry I am that I couldn't be part of your life, my... Alistair. Though I didn't have the opportunity to be a mother to you, I can certainly say that I'm proud of the steadfast and forthright young man you've become. You've... You've met Alistair, right, Iris? That does not follow. Zara leans over to you. <laughs> More like bread fast and uptight, am I right? Wow! Wow! Ouch! I mean, the uptight part is definitely true, but ouch! What? Zara! What? Too soon? A, a little bit, yeah. It seems I must terminate this current connection shortly. Please hurry to the facility. It won't be safe, or safe to travel that way much longer. Iris struggles to continue speaking. Goodbye, Alistair. I love you very much. No! Mother, wait! The hologram fades, and the terminal goes dark. Alistair, I'm so sorry. She died when I was only two. I never thought I'd remember what her face looked like. Alistair lowers himself to the floor, resting his face in his hands. So wait, there were no pictures of your mom anywhere around? What the fuck, man? My megalomaniac of a father brought her back as an automaton, a mere servant! The next time I see him, he'll have hell to pay! I mean, he didn't get this idea of your mom as a servant out of nowhere, dude. It's pretty telling how Everett works sees women at this point. Just saying. Just then, the sound of distant growling reaches your ears. Uh-oh. Where's Furball? The sounds coming from inside that hole. Inside the partially collapsed wall, there's a narrow, cave-like space. At the far end, Furball is crouched and ready to pounce on a small crystalline fragment. <laughs> Angry face. Green fire flickers into being along the surface of the crystal. He's very angry face. Uh, that shard looks like it's got an evil spirit trapped in it. It's just like the light that surrounded Quinn. So we can poke the shard or watch it cautiously. Um, I think we've determined we have no, no sense of self-preservation. So I'm gonna, I'm a poke it. Stand back, little guy. You touch the burning shard with your index finger. The flames instantly recede and you're able to pick it up without harm. 
All right, cool. We've got a fragment of what's probably kryptonite, so let's take it. Guess I'll hold on to this till I find out what's up with these crystals. And how exactly did you know to do that? Um, I've seen movies and I just poked it. Uh, wild guess? I mean, that's basically what it was, so. We should head back to the others. The three of you and Furball head outside. As you walk out of the shelter, you notice movement in a nearby thicket of trees. Ah! Clearly something's over there. Yes, Alistair, we got that, thank you. Get ready. You prepare yourselves for whatever rampaging beast might be approaching. <laughs> of course it's Varen. Ha! Another miss. Varen comes running out of the undergrowth with Diego close behind. They seem too engaged in whatever they're doing to notice you. Ha <laughs> ha! You think you're so fast? Eat this! Diego throws a seed pod at the young Vanti King. He deftly dodges. And, and he apparently is very proud of himself for doing so. With a wry grin, Varen pretends to look around for cover, intentionally leaving himself open. Mm, mm hmm Diego picks up another pod and pegs him in the chest. This, this has definite flavors of, like, let the small child win. This is adorable. Oi! How dare you! I am the Elishar! Yeah, not, not my king, dude. Shut up. <laughs> Varen dramatically falls to the forest floor. It's official! I, Diego Ricardo Ortiz Soto, have caught them all. Oh my god, I don't know, y'all. I think there were still only, like, you know, 300 of the little bastards when this came out. <laughs> now, now there's a whole mobile game about it. Winded, Diego sits down next to Varen. Diego is precious. He is a very precious boy. You notice Zara getting ready to clear her throat. No, shh. We're gonna voyeur. What are you doing? We should... We can let them have their moment or interrupt. I'm not... I'm not interrupting this. I hate that they're charging me diamonds for this. This is part of what I don't like about this book is that... Basically, in order for your friends to be happy, you have to spend diamonds. Like, I'm fine with it being for the player character, but when I- well, and it's not the only choices book that does this, but when it comes to, like, my friend's happiness, I shouldn't have to spend fucking diamonds to make that happen. That's just cruel. But, we're, we're going to let them have their moment. And I have a feeling we're gonna watch it, too. You motion to Zara. She shrugs and heads back toward the beach. Alistair takes Furball and follows. Yep, our voyeuristic ass over here. Diego and Varen lie on the jungle floor amid shimmering, bioluminescent flowers. You know, I really owe you a whole handful of those seeds right in the face. How many times did I get in trouble for telling everyone you were studying when really you'd snuck out to surf Colonnade Cove? Oh, oh. I mean, the things you'll do for love, right, Diego? <laughs> many times. 
You are a very good tutor. <laughs> it's not the definition of a good tutor, but okay. <sighs> and now you're the Elishar, and I'm one of the twelve. Who would have thought? I never expected to take my mother's place. It happened so fast, I... Varin suddenly seems on the verge of tears. Never got to say goodbye. No, oh, baby. It's okay. Poor Diego. Diego places a hand on Varin's shoulder in an effort to comfort him. Poor Varin! Zimadra was very brave to do what she did. She did it for all of us, but mostly because she loved you and knew you'd make a great Elishar. Yes. And, as it turns out, you're basically Aragorn. The king no one expected, but everyone hoped for. This makes me very glad that I did not choose Aragorn for Jake's nickname in book one, because otherwise this would just be all manner of awkward. <gasps> you really think I'm airborn? Oh god. These poor, poor babies. No, Arab. Never mind. Yes, I do. Because imagine, imagine if Varen had heard us calling Jake Aragorn and now he would be really confused. So confused. Varen grabs Diego in a tight hug. <laughs> uh, easy there. Diego is that awkward friend who's just like, I don't know what to do. Help. Uh, I picked Top Gun for Jake. Um, just because pilot. So, yeah. Also, apparently, this is one pop culture reference that is not going to come up in these books. Thank you, Diego. <laughs> of course. They separate slightly, and their eyes meet. Suddenly, they pull apart. Diego swallows hard. Varen's gaze drifts around the area. Oh my god, please tell me we're gonna, like, dive into the bushes, because otherwise this is so goddamn awkward. <clears throat> uh, so... How many tribal festivals have you guys had, anyway? <laughs> This, this, this is the, uh, this is the Vanti equivalent of, yeah, how about them Nicks? <laughs> Aside from today, I've only attended one other Valinorum. I was no older than Tari then. My mother was occupied with hosting, and I wasn't receiving much attention. So I took Ukjal's symbol of office, a very special clay whistle, to the top of a coconut tree. <gasps> Varen, you little juvenile delinquent. <laughs> and dropped it on the Kuktanoi champion's head and broke into countless pieces. <laughs> Sounds like you were a little brat. I was. Poor Ukshaw. The two of them lean back on their hands in silence, looking off into the rainforest. Diego moves his arm nearer to Varen's. Varen tentatively reaches out to take his hand. Oh. 
Diego. I am grateful to have met you. <laughs> Pleasure's all mine. Mm-hmm. You have pleasure? Oh, God. Oh, no. How does this translate, Infanti? Oh, dear. Uh, I, I mean, pleasure, not like, that's not, uh, too late. It's awkward. Oh, I'm gonna try to pretend the last three seconds didn't happen. Do or do not. There is no try. Oh my god. Oh. You precious, precious babies. Ah! That was actually a pretty solid reference. Diego intertwines his fingers with Varen's. Varen turns to squint into the trees. Somehow you can tell that he's picked up on your presence. Yeah, it's not like we were telepathically bonded at any point or anything. Why? Why would he know we were there? A smile spreads across his face. <laughs> Kira is a very good friend to you. Oh my god, this is getting creepier. We need to leave. Just leave, Kira. What are you doing? Oh, we got points with Diego, though. <laughs> the best I've ever had. Why do you... Oh! Uh, <laughs> hey, Kira. <laughs> I totally ha- I just got here. I didn't hear or see anything. Mm-mm. <clears throat> hey guys! I've got good news. Let's get everyone together. <laughs> I'm just glossing right over the whole situation. I love it. A little while later, your friends and several Vonti are gathered around you on the beach. So, apparently this Lernian, Lernian gate can get us home, but we'll need the island's heart to power it. Home? Already? B but I was kind of enjoying myself. We've been here for like over six months, my dude. Yeah, we worked hard to get this vacation, and I think we should see it through. W what does that even mean now, Craig? Seriously, what? Uh, pretty sure it was given to us for free. Well, I mean, to start with. Real question is, can we actually trust RoboMade now that Rourke's reprogrammed her? Yeah, my money's on no. See? There you go. Besides, what's so bad about this place anyway? I like it here. Well, yeah, of course you do, but some of us, like, have things to get back to. <sighs> Craig, how many times have you almost died in the last week? Uh, I think I lost count. I trust her. Uh, you do? My father may have made her into what she is now, but even he couldn't take away her humanity. She wasn't lying to us. She clearly wanted to help. Everyone pauses to reflect on Alistair's words. You can't know for a fact that she was telling the truth. An AI with unlimited database access is not someone you want to trust. Hmm, that's a good point. 
But if there's even a slim chance we can get home, I think we should try. Wow, sorry. Grace is right. Who knows when we'll have another opportunity like this? So, you are leaving then? I guess so. I'll be sorry to see you go, but I suppose I must accept that your destiny is larger than Vanu. And you're okay with us taking the heart? I mean, it's kind of attached to our friend now, so it would be really awkward if you had a problem with this. Of course. I will accompany you to ensure that it returns to Elistel. Alright, seems fair. The northern reaches are dangerous. It is different there. Oh, so this is the undangerous part of the island. Great. I will arrange for several of our best warriors to come along as well. Oh my god, I... Our, our fellowship is growing. All right, so we're doing this. Lila hasn't said anything. Estella gestures toward Lila, who's sitting in the sand a short distance away, looking very sad. Hey... You all right, Lila? Huh? Oh! Oh, I'm fine. Everything's great. We're going home! Yay! Uh-huh. Lila, we can say... Were you hoping to stay? Are you worried about your job? Or... Do you think it's a trap? Um... I think the most reasonable assumption to make at this point would be whether she's worried about her job. Um, especially since the last thing we knew, Rourke was telling her, you know, look after the kids, basically. Um, so if we go, what's her job? So, Lila, are you worried about your job? What? <laughs> No! Why would I be worried about- <sighs> Come on. We all know you do more around here than just lead tours. Yeah, you cut people's braids off with arrows from a tree branch. You still haven't explained that. <sighs> well, it doesn't seem like I've been doing any job particularly well. Everything on La Huerta's falling to ruin. Hmm, perhaps. But you've still been a very good guide to us. <gasps> really? Yes. And you fight well. I mean, in Estella language, that's like I love you. I guess I do, actually. Lila stands up and seems to shrug off her melancholy. Thanks, you two. I feel a lot better. Now. That was awkward. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh. I think the island's finally getting to me. I just thought I saw Wednesday Adams over there give someone a pep talk. <laughs> Not sure Wednesday Adams applies here, because Wednesday was far more likely to kill people through manipulation than through, you know, actual combat, but whatever. Estella shrugs nonchalantly. Just then, Ukjal arrives with a group of Vanti scouts. 
Like the ever-roaming constellations themselves, the Catalyst's journey toward a new horizon. Okay. He removes the island's heart from a satchel and hands it to you. Good fortune on the path ahead, friends. You will always be remembered by our people. Okay. Cool. I want to go too! The Catalyst's path is leading them away from our people, Tari. Hmm. But I'm a Catalyst too! Okay, kid. You are a little boy who is about one more word away from not eating supper. Hey, don't withhold food from kids as punishment. They grow up into adults like me. Aww. We owe so much to you, Catalysts. May your stars guide you. Catalyst is forever! Oh, okay. Okay. It's cute. We should make whatever preparations we need and then get some rest. We'll head out first thing in the morning. I feel like that's a decision for our guides who know the island, but sure, Sean. Hmm. I, uh, Cap. The next morning, you set out on your journey northward. It is very ominous. Yeah, withholding dessert is very different from withholding dinner. Yeah, I agree. As you crest the foothills of a mountain range, the temperate sea breeze gives way to a noticeable chill. One of the Vanti scouts suddenly stops and points into the distance. Much snow up ahead! You look toward the distant slopes and see gleaming snow running all the way down to the shoreline. It will be very cold soon. We must prepare. But this is a tropical island. Yeah, and if you've been to Hawaii, um, the big island, you'll know that it gets very cold on the top of Kilauea. So. How far north did we walk anyway? It must be a time anomaly. Maybe an ice age from thousands of years ago. The scouts produced rolled blankets and offer them to several members of your group. You will need this. Uh, sure. I'll take one. Toscal, thank you. Well, it's something at least. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you so much! Eventually, the scouts run out, leaving you and a few others without extra covering. Oh, is this the moment where we just, like... We do the, the really cheesy girlfriend thing where you're like, I mean, this only works if we're quite a bit smaller physically than Jake, but we just like bud budge up in front of him and stick our arms into the sleeves of his jacket and we just walk together like penguins. Is that what we do? Because that, that would be adorable. Elevation does make air cold. I live within two hours of 10,000 feet. So yeah, when... 
When you lose a lot of the air up above you, uh, the insulating properties go down really quickly. I mean, it can be 100 degrees down at my elevation, which is still not sea level, and it'll be like 50 on the mountaintop. So yeah. Yeah. You notice your breath turning into clouds of steam in the air. Your teeth start to chatter. Kira, you need a jacket. I'm too small. Grace rummages around in her backpack. Yet another one of these random people just carrying clothes for us for no reason. Fortunately, I'm always cold and bring lots of extra layers. Okay, this makes a small bit of sense. Uh, Jake and Sean carrying around clothes that would fit us does not. I mean, it, okay, if the camo outfit hadn't been so very obviously, uh, you know, femmed up, then I would say, yeah, that one kind of made sense for Jake, but nah, those were clearly women's clothes. Try these on. Chill out. The cold never bothered you anyway. Hmm. I I appreciate the reference given uh, who our model very closely resembles in design. Um, and and that would be my my uh, my queer platonic wife. And I will not hear any slander against her. And yes, I'm looking forward to the next Frozen movie. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's cute, you know, and at least coming from Grace, it makes sense. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this because I know things, but yeah, we'll buy it. So we've unlocked Chill Out in the closet. Let winter come. I'm ready. Okay. C calm down there. Calm down there, princess. Aw, you look so cozy and cuddly. I still think we should have burrowed inside Jake's jacket, but that's just me. Layered, locked, and loaded. <laughs> that is such an odd thing to say, but it's cute. With most of the group bundled up, you proceed toward the frozen landscape ahead. As you trudge onward, the snow underfoot becomes thick enough to crunch with each step. Cold winds drive clusters of falling snow into your faces. Oh, this is just miserable. Yeah, freaking ice age around here. What's next, some kind of meteor impact? For fuck's sake, Craig, don't give this island ideas. I'm pretty sure it's listening. Thank you, Jake. Don't give the anomalies any ideas, Gronk. You know, it just just for that. Just for that little bit of genre savvy there. Take a drink. One member of your group actually seems more chipper than ever. <gasps> Furball! Oh my goodness, he's in his happy place. Furball repeatedly runs ahead, then stops and waits for you to catch up. Well, at least he's in his element. Brumch. What's wrong, little guy? 
Someone's there. A lone silhouette stands amid the white haze. Uh, hello? There's no response. Who's there? A small circle glows red near the figure's face, accompanied by a wisp of smoke. Oh no. Oh no! No! I'm not ready yet! You finally draw close enough to see who it is. Lundgren. No! No! I'm not ready. Atop a military jumpsuit, the man wears an intricate steel exoskeleton. Uh, steel is really fucking heavy. I don't think this is made out of steel. Aluminum, probably. Titanium, maybe. Steel? No. No. He takes another drag from his cigar and fixes Jake in his stern gaze. Jacob, how long's it been? Not long enough, you miserable- Ay, 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 boy, you are not allowed to get yourself killed yet. Got a whole other book yet. Your family's disappointed in you, Mackenzie. First you sold American arms to a Karzestani dictator. Then you resisted arrest and took yourself off the grid. <laughs> what do you want, Lundgren? Mm -hmm. You, Mackenzie. I'm here to bring you in. Uh, Jake? Who the hell is this dude, anyway? I think he's his old commander. Had to break the news to your mama myself. Sorry, ma'am. Your son betrayed his country and endangered his fellow soldiers. Oh, God. Ugh! I, I want to punch him in the face. I would fight very bravely and die very quickly. And then I held her as she cried hysterically. Hm, <laughs> least I could do. Oh my god, Jake is gonna kill you first. You touched his mother. With any kind of hands. He's, oh my god, he's gonna kill him. Don't. You. Dare. No. No, don't do anything stupid. Ha. <laughs> that all you got, boy? Lying around in a hammock's made you soft. Yes. Soft enough to have character growth. God damn it. We both know what happened, Lundgren. What you did. You killed him. <laughs> Jacob. Well, I'd love to catch up on old times. I'm gonna need you to come with me if you don't want your new friends to get hurt. No. No. Where, where are our elite Vanti soldiers? What the fuck? Seriously. This is why you're supposed to be here, is to deal with this. Hmm. Kira, we should be able to take him if he's on his own. Wow, Estella has a very bright view of our chances here. Hmm. Arachnid, into position. Lundgren signals, 
and a series of armored hummers comes roaring over a nearby ridge. Soldiers emerge from the vehicles and begin to move into formation, readying their rifles. Well, that's not creepy at all. Why do their faces glow? This seems very... very not stealthy. That just looks impractical. Princess, it's me he wants. Take the others and get out of here. Oh, child, we need to explain to you about making deals with villains, because here's the thing about making deals with villains. Stay with me here, Jake. They're villains. They are not obliged to uphold their end of the deal because they have no honor. Like, dude, think about this for five fucking seconds, please. I'm begging you. I'm begging you, my man. I mean, yes, they have a spider theme, but I still don't understand why the faces glow. I just... What if you're sneaking around in the dark? Do they, do they have a control? Can they shut it off? If they can shut it off, then why would they ever turn it on? I have questions. What? Jake, I, I can't just... Uh, are we really doing this right now? I'm trying to decide whether Michelle is going to propose leaving Jake behind or throwing down against a squad of elite soldiers. Honestly, she could go either way. <laughs> Jake, we can say, I'm not leaving you, which, yes, 100% chance of success. I love these. Or, you're right, we've got to split up. No, no, why would I abandon one of my friends to this guy and a squad of elite soldiers when clearly... Taking him in means killing him. <sighs> no. Jake, I'm not leaving you. <laughs> Damn it, princess. Why you gotta make me feel weak at a time like this? Okay, first of all, don't blame me for your feelings. Second of all, um, caring about your friends isn't weakness, so can we not with that right now? Thank you. Craig's Craig quietly scoops up several handfuls of snow. So, so, hmm. Sean and Zara follow his cue and do the same. I just, I really want to enjoy for a second Craig looking at Lundgren, who by all appearances is a mountain of a man, probably with a born to kill tattoo. And if you get that reference, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> early 2000s country music, y'all. Um, and, and a squad of soldiers in tactical gear and thinks to himself, you know what would, would tip the scales in my favor here? Some snowballs. Not the ice fox we have running around or the squad of Vonti soldiers who know this island better than these guys do. Oh no, 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 no. It's the snowballs. Oh, Craig. Oh, Craig. I mean, yeah, how do you quietly pick up handfuls of snow? So it is implied that Lundgren still is some distance away. It's just that we can kind of see him better. But if all of his attention is on Jake, um, then yeah, like, and depending on the quality of the snow. So if it's nice, like, soft, you know, slushy snow that actually makes good snowballs, it's not super loud when you scoop into it. If this is like hard, crusty, two-day-old snow, which it shouldn't be because they've said it's snowing on us, then yeah, you'd have that crunch, crunch as you ball it up. But no, I, I believe he could do it quietly. I'm more concerned about, you know, invisibly, stealthily. How, how is no one seeing what he's doing? That's what I want to know. How deep is this snowdrift we're standing in? Because that's going to put me at a tactical disadvantage. Okay. Anyway, Jake, you're not weak. Friend, having friends is not weakness. God damn it. 
I know, I know you think it is because your friend died, but you know what? It's time to grow your character again, goddammit. No! What? Now what? Craig, remember the last time you came in just throwing projectiles and how that ended for us? Craig. No, no. This, this boy is gonna get us killed. The three of them pelt the still readying soldiers with hard packed snowballs. Which I'm sure is so devastating through their body armor. <sighs> yeah. Child. Child, what are you doing? Oh god. Oof! <laughs> Everybody, run! Scouts, protect the Catalyst's retreat! The Vanti so scouts draw spears and rush forward to engage the soldiers. I feel like this isn't the best course of action, but sure. I feel like you should have attacked stealthily from behind. You, Jake, and the others use the momentary distraction to scramble toward a nearby ravine. Rounding the mountain slope, you nearly run off the edge of a cliff. What? Ugh! <gasps> Diego! Diego's foot slips on the precipice, and he struggles to throw his weight backward. I should grab him. You latch on to Diego and manage to steady him. Oh my god. Thanks, Kira. You have my gratitude as well. I mean, he's my best friend, but... I bet that's how Craig died in Zara's totem. He threw a rock at Rourke. I mean, I would not be the least bit surprised if that's how Craig died in Zara's idol scene. Not at all. And you know what? I don't think he would be either. I feel like Craig would be like, nah, you know what? I'd go out like that. <laughs> That's a really long fall. The bottom of the chasm is lost in darkness, hundreds of feet below. Does the chasm have a bottom? Can we exploit this? Dudes, there's a path around the edge! Raj moves as fast as he can up a narrow walkway, bottles clinking in his messenger bag. Everyone else follows. Jake glances back the way you came. <gasps> They're gaining on us! Keep moving, princess. The snowfall becomes heavier as you ascend. A wrecked aircraft comes into view, its wings balancing precariously atop two adjacent cliffs. Well, if this doesn't just sound like an Indiana Jones movie, I don't know what does. I mean, honestly, this crosses out of Indiana Jones and into some Tomb Raider shit. Oh my god. As your gaze returns to the walkway, you notice someone rounding a corner ahead. <laughs> well, well. Don't I just feel like the Pied Piper? You. Oh my god, Jake, how many angry ex-bosses do you have? What? You know her, too? Eh, you might.
might say Wolf and I go way back. Is she trying to make us jealous? Is that what this is? Because, like, I kind of don't feel like I have to be. The woman reaches over her shoulders and unsheathes two katanas. Oh, God. Do, do we have to have the talk about how hard it is to actually wear a sword across your back and then draw it? Because, you know, blades are long, especially on a katana. And you have to, like, clear the sheath to get it out. Um, and most people don't have arms that long and aren't that bendy. Especially the way they showed them sticking up over her shoulders. Yeah, no, this that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. The tech-enhanced blades radiate waves of heat, causing the cliffside to weep melting snow as she moves closer. Okay, you don't really want your metal blades that you're going to be hitting things with to get warm because they'll warp and they'll lose their edge and... These people really don't know how anything about how you make swords, do they? They apparently also don't know how katanas are used. Like, watch some fucking history channel, okay? Please, God. Here, kitty kitties. It, is that supposed to be kitties, like cats? Because I think that makes more sense. <clears throat> I don't like her. Okay. <laughs> uh, little help here, guys? Uh, Raj Dowser. But I've only got my good stuff on hand. <laughs> Just do it. Raj reaches inside his bag and pulls out a champagne bottle. Dude, just use this as a bludgeon. Do you have any idea how solid champagne bottles are? How much pressure they actually have to contain? Oh my god. These things are fantastic bludgeons. I hope you like Chateauneuf de Pop. Pape. I don't know. Sorry, France. Cause I do. Aww. He sabers open the bottle. With what I don't know. Causing foam and liquid to spray at the woman. Gah! I just love that these elite soldiers are being foiled by what are the laziest, like, most childish ways to hurt people. Yeah, we can't actually hit people. We have to do incredibly convoluted things to knock people out. Because, you know, T for teen, I guess, we we can say son of a bitch and God damn it. What else can we say? Can't can't we say shit in this? I think we can. And and we can have not highly graphic, but still, you know. Not fade to black sex scenes, but by golly, we can't hit anybody. <laughs> like throwing an oxygen tank at an orca instead of hitting a man over the head with an oxygen tank. Yeah, yeah, let let the orca do your dirty work. Mm -hmm. That's that's how this is. That's how this is. You You can't do it yourself. You have to let nature do it for you. That's why it was okay to hit people with snowballs, but not our fists. It was nature at work. Where is Furball, by the way? No one has said anything about Furball in a while, and I'm worried. Where is our little Frost Fox? Where is he? Popping sounds come from the katanas as the champagne coats them. A cloud of hissing steam rises, blinding her. How much champagne was in this bottle? Whew! Good call, Kira! Yeah! <laughs> Suck on that! 
You hear a series of heavy thuds, and you suddenly realize that someone's approaching behind you. Told Lundgren I wasn't gonna kill any of you. The hulking brute points one of his mechanical fists toward the mountain slope. <laughs> Guess I lied. Joy. The power fist strikes the rock force rock face with a deafening crack, causing the walkway to tremor beneath your feet. Fissures form in the slope, and huge chunks of stone roll down toward you. Oh shit. I smell more timed choices coming up. We gotta cross! Head for the plane! Uh, but that thing looks like it could fall at any minute. If it was gonna fall, it would've already. Everybody, come on! Okay, that's not actually how that works, because it's in stable equilibrium right now, and you're gonna add a bunch of unstable weight to it, Sean. Also, it's supporting its own weight. That's no guarantee it can support 12 times... We'll round... Okay. We'll round up to everybody weighs 200 pounds apiece. I know I'm overestimating, but I don't care. 200 and... No, no! 2,400 pounds. You want me to add... Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you want me to add an extra ton of weight to this thing. And hope that those wing joints don't give out? Yeah, no. No. Um, I'm terrified. Aww. Leaving so soon? Um, yes? M m Madame, uh, Madame Bulletproof Boobs? The woman redoubles her approach. She touches a disc near the center of her suit, causing her to become nearly undetectable against the cliff. Oh, good. Camouflage suits. But how, what, how does it camo her face? Because her face isn't inside her suit. Uh... And, and her weapons? It camos her weapons? I have so many questions. Don't worry. When it happens, you won't see a thing. <laughs> I don't know why she's the Wicked Witch of the West, but she is now. As the cloaked katana wielder and hulking brute converge, everyone rushes onto the wings of the plane. I like how we're about to be killed by precision and also brute force. Gunfire rings out across the chasm. This just keeps escalating. There are more on top of the mountain! Lundgren and his soldiers are standing on the summit, their automatic rifles pointed at you. Oh, it's a good thing nobody in Lundgren's squad is a sniper. Because if they were, we'd be dead already, and we wouldn't have heard the shots. Because they'd be like five miles away. Well, that's a little too far. I don't... I forget what the, uh what the current distance record is for a sniper, but it's pretty fucking far. <laughs> yeah, the obvious answer is nanotech, because that's the answer that non-science scientists use for everything. Yeah, these nanobots are just clinging to her from all angles and, and projecting this this image across their their shells so that you know, you can't see the nanobots, but there's just so many of them, and they're clearly not obscuring her vision at all. Oh, no, no, no. No, because she can see through them because of the way the... Mmm. Mmm. Okay. Lundgren, for his part, does not look pleased that we've made it this far. 
crap! We're sitting ducks! And I want to remind you, walking onto the wings of, an, of a plane that's been here for God knows how long. So we're adding a, about a ton of weight to this plane, and it's getting shot up by automatic rifles. Which is further damaging its structural integrity. We are going to die. This is where we die. The third book is about completely different people. This is some Game of Thrones shit, y'all. <laughs> Estella drops onto the cab of the plane and uses her heel to bash open a rusted boarding door. God bless you, Estella. Inside! Now! Each member of your group jumps through into the gutted interior of the plane. Okie dokie. Estella remains beside the door, standing guard. You hear Lundgren's voice from outside. So they're on a mountaintop, but we can still hear him. Okay. Gas a mouse. Oh, oh, I see. This is through... This is through somebody's comms. Gotcha. A few moments later, a masked figure drops onto the nose of the plane and smashes the front windshield. So, so... Spider-Man knockoff in red over here is apparently Mouse. I don't know how we figure he's angry. He hurls a series of canisters inside. Violet-covered gas drifts out of the cans, threatening to quickly fill the cabin. It's not like we just came in through an open door and can't just, you know, chuck the gas canisters out the door. Oh no! No, no! We can't do that! We're probably just going to lay here and die. Oh no! I don't have a cannon this time! We have an open door, Grace! God! Uh, check the cockpit controls. <laughs> because I, I know what I said, but I also know what the game wants. There's gotta be something on this dashboard. Yes, like throwing the cans outside. <laughs> I know, we're trying to deal with the obvious threat of a human being punching through the windshield. I know that's what we're doing, but it feel like... The other 11 people in the room can probably be throwing the canisters out the door. <gasps> Here! You flick a lever labeled emergency oxygen masks. Okay, fun point about um, emergency oxygen masks on planes. If this thing still even has pressure in the O2 tank, which honestly, I kind of doubt. Um... There's usually only about, like, 15 seconds of oxygen in there or something, which is the, which is the thing that, um, that people love to cite to go, like, oh, you know, basically it's just to get you high before you die. That is actually not why. Number one, you kind of have to optimize how much compressed gas you can store on a plane, um, because, I mean, they have to be compressing this in order to have enough for you know, what's often over a hundred people on a plane. But two, if you can't fix your cabin pressure problem inside of about 15 seconds, you're all fucked anyway. So, it's basically why. There's gotta be something on this dashboard. Me, when I want something to laugh at on Tumblr. I mean, <laughs> sounds about right. <laughs> Panels pop open in the ceiling, and masks on rubber tubes descend over the passenger seats. Hopefully, there's at least 12. <gasps> Brilliant! Hopefully this isn't tear gas or something and gonna mess up our eyes! <laughs> Good call. Still think we should have just thrown them outside, but... Yeah. As the toxic gas rises, everyone takes seats and puts on masks. We've got 15 seconds for this shit to disperse before we die. You notice Craig struggling to open a wall-mounted first aid cabinet. 
How the hell are you supposed to get this to... Craig, what do you need in there? Through a window in the cabinet, you see a glistening amber figurine. Okay, so this is not the moment to be uh, going after a catalyst idol, but it's our only chance. So we're going to pull the latch on the cabinet because apparently Craig can't use his eyes. The door of the cabinet swings open and a crumpled note falls out. Found this during the excavation. Silas should be interested in it. Don't show it to any of Rourke's people. Henry. Hmm. Odd place to stash it. You take out the idol and hand it to Craig. This is a great moment to have an idol scene, by the way. <laughs> nice, Kira. Just as he grabs a hold of it, the world melts away in a wash of rippling colors. You're suddenly in an airport waiting area. Craig and Sean are standing next to a pile of luggage. Heck yeah, bro! One tropical island vacation coming up! <laughs> Can't wait. Hey, you find out yet? Uh, nah. They'll probably email me tomorrow or something. You got this, Sal. I talked to those NFL guys about you. What? You did? Yeah. They were like, so what do you think of 68? He any good? And? And he told them you suck. What do you think, Craig? I mean, yeah, that's fair. I might be dying soon, so might as well have a quick trip into my friend's memory. Yeah, but was it really a trip into your friend's memory, or was it just a hallucination from oxygen poisoning? Who knows? I told them the truth. They aren't gonna find a better run-blocking guard at any school in the state. Aww. Oh, wow. Appreciate it, bro. I don't know. Maybe I do have a shot. <laughs> Hallucination or or trip into the memory? Por qué no los dos? I mean, yeah. I was also terrible Spanish. I'm so sorry. Por qué no los dos? I'm still not great with it tonight. I don't know what's going on. Whatever. Oh, wow. Is that Zara Namazi? A short distance away, Zara undips, unzips a black duffel bag and breaks out her laptop. Apparently unconcerned by their presence. Hmm. So she's coming to La Huerta too. I haven't seen her since... Sophomore year... An uncharacteristic sadness creeps into Craig's expression. Sean doesn't seem to notice. Hmm. Emotional intelligence not working there, huh? <gasps> no way! Sean Gale is coming too? <gasps> really? He is? Several other students flock over to Sean. His confidence and assured ease seem to immediately dazzle them. Craig watches as if from a completely different world. His phone suddenly lights up with an email. <gasps> oh, 
It's from them. Dear Craig Sow, our draft scouts were glad to make your acquaintance at the Heartful Varsity Mixer. He's, he's feeling good about this so far. As I'm certain you're aware, we're limited on the number of athletes we can consider for the 2017 NFL College Draft. While we won't be able to include you on our list, we wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Oof. Uh, I mean, plenty of players do get into the NFL and have fantastic careers being undrafted, but it does make the road harder. The sound of cheering and laughter comes from the group surrounding Sean. Craig's gaze falls to the floor. Aw, poor buddy. The vision grows dim. You're yanked through time and space, the inertia bringing you to the edge of nausea. There is no edge of nausea. You're either nauseous or you're not. There are levels of nausea, but there's no edge of nausea. The verge of throwing up, maybe. You find yourself in an unfamiliar laboratory that looks eerily like the one that's in the volcano, but whatever, I guess. Several of your friends are gathered around a computer terminal. Craig is standing near a steel double door. And as usual for this part of the, uh, the idol scenes, trigger warning for named character death, at least one. Big guy, you coming or not? Portal's almost ready to go. <sighs> Ain't nothing for me back home. A muffled explosion shakes the room. The double door cracks open slightly. They'll be inside soon. A trap door opens in the floor. Everyone begins climbing down. Michelle waits on the ladder, looking up through the hatch. Craig, what the hell? Come on! Craig walks over to the terminal, squints at the screen, and taps something. It's been real, guys. The hatch snaps shut. I have a very serious problem with this idea that just because he was turned down for the NFL draft, that there, that there is, quote, nothing left for him back home. And I'll tell you why. There is a shit ton of pressure laid on people nowadays to basically have the course of their life decided before they graduate high school. And that just continues to back up farther and farther. I've heard of sixth graders who are convinced that they can't have their chosen career because they failed an algebra class. Like, this is some bullshit in our society. You... Getting turned down for one opportunity is not the end of your fucking life. Like... Putting aside considerations of like depression and other mental health problems that just get exacerbated by this type of situation. You're looking at an entire society that pushes this narrative and this is just reinforcing that. Craig presumably has a family and he's definitely got friends who, you know, love and respect him. But oh no, there's nothing left for him back home because he got turned down for the draft. And if there's another reason that Craig has, quote-unquote, nothing left back home, they're doing a piss-poor job of showing it in this narrative. This is not okay. Y'all. I don't know who needs to hear this. But just because things didn't go 
the exact perfect way that maybe everyone thinks they should have gone doesn't mean that your entire dream is done. Just because you fail one math class doesn't mean you can't be a scientist. Just because, you know, you, you don't get drafted by the NFL straight out of college, that doesn't mean that you can't play in the NFL. That's, in fact, categorically untrue. All you have to do is watch an NFL game and you'll see how many of these guys are undrafted. Because, yeah, like, that's just the way life is. And if our society would stop being so, you know, you get one shot and if you miss, you're done, then maybe we could, you know, not have this problem. So, yeah, I, mm, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Mm -mm. No, thank you. <sighs> Especially since we all know how the, the Catalyst Idol scenes end for the particular Catalyst they're about. Yeah. Another detonation finally knocks the double door off its hinges. Three soldiers enter the lab. Surrender or be neutralized. Oh dear. Screw you! As the soldiers ready their rifles, Craig runs headlong at them. <sighs> I hate to say it, but against firearms, this is not necessarily the worst thing you can do if you're unarmed. But you have to close that distance real quick. You've got... You've got a better shot if they have rifles, actually, because it's a lot easier to get inside that distance. And it's a lot harder for them to turn once you're inside it. A handgun is pretty easy to pivot. A rifle still needs that, you know, two, three feet, depending on the size of the barrel, to be effective. The nice thing about guns is they are very directional. They only hurt you if you're in front of them. Roar! He plows down the group like a bunch of rag dolls, sending bodies and weapons clattering across the floor. <laughs> Craig turns to run through the door, but a towering figure blocks his way. <laughs> like your style, kid. One side, jerk face! What? That's my line! I don't know why he got southern there. I don't know what's going on with anybody's voice tonight. The titan of a man deploys both mechanical fists into Craig's chest. He's thrown clear across the room, crashing heavily against the opposite wall. Oof! Craig slumps to the floor, gasping. Yeah, blunt force trauma to the chest is, uh, pretty damaging. You're gonna tell your friends to come out, or do I gotta make you fly again? <laughs> You're too late. <laughs> gonna suck to have to tell Rourke you blew it again. He probably wouldn't even waste a cryotube on a loser like you. Just scrap you f <coughs> for spare <coughs> parts. <gasps> he is shocked! Craig's chuckle turns into choking. He gasps in vain for breath. And finally, his head drops forward. And then, you're exactly where you were moments earlier. Mm-hmm. 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 Good God. We're really getting tired of watching everybody die. 
Huh? What's up, Kira? The violet gas continues to billow through the cabin. Uh, nothing. Quick, get your mask on. All right. So that is nine out of 12 catalyst idols. Hmm, interesting. The gas finally begins to dissipate. Um, unless we can make this thing fly, we should probably get out. The screech of metal grinding against metal assaults your ears. Estella peers out the door. Her eyes widen. <gasps> She's cutting apart the wing! This is your captain speaking. Fasten your seatbelts, please. <laughs> it's gonna be a rough landing. Oh boy. <gasps> There's a door on the other side. Lila points at a rusted door on the opposite side of the plane's cabin. All right, we're gonna, we're just gonna force that door open, I guess. You climb out into what seems like a cloud of snow. A heavy blizzard makes it impossible to see beyond a few feet. And one would hope that uh, Lundgren's really bad snipers don't have IR scopes. Which I'm not sure how well those would work in a blizzard anyway, but still. The plane lurches violently beneath you. Go! Before it gets cut down! Where is Furball? Someone please tell me that Furball is safe. Nobody's saying anything. Everyone tries to carefully balance their way across the other wing, struggling to shield themselves from the biting cold and blasting wind. But your cold weather gear protects you from the elements. Hey, hey. Take my hand. Form a chain. I'll get us across. Come on, link up. You concentrate and steadily make your way across the icy wing leading your friends across. Keep going. Don't look down. Kira's almost got us across. We're home free. Your feet finally arrive at snow-covered stone. Oh, we made it. Alistair wraps you in a tight hug, then collects himself and pulls away. That's terrifying. <clears throat> um, thank you for refraining from killing us all. Oh my god. Sorry. Seconded! Behind you, the woman's superheated sword sliced through the last of the far wing. A loud rumble fills the air as the plane careens into the shadowy abyss. <sighs> Bullets whiz through the densely falling snow around you. Great, someone has an IR scope. Fan-fucking-tastic. This is exactly what we needed. Get back here! Playtime isn't over yet. Damn it! We can't get across! 
Now's our chance! We can lose them in the blizzard! You find your way up the other side of the chasm and arrive at a wide plateau. Though it's difficult to see, you manage to discern voices over the wind. Sean? Anyone? You guys there? Please say something. Follow my voice. Come to me, catalysts. Baron? Where are you? Gradually, your friends begin to find each other. I don't understand why we let go of each other in the first place, but whatever. Once reassembled, you hold on to each other and hurry to put distance between yourselves and the chasm. A large crate pokes out of the snow ahead. Is that... It must be cargo from the plane! Words are printed on the metal box, but there's too much ice to be able to read them. You use the sleeve of your jacket to brush away thick layers of snow and ice. And now you know why I bought the jacket. Man Sing Transglobal Tech. Okay. So that is a clue. We've found six out of eight clues in this act. Wh what? Grace, isn't that the name of your mother's company? Why would they be sending equipment here? I don't know, but we should keep moving. This storm doesn't look like it's going to let up. You continue on through the blizzard. Eventually, you lose track of how much time you've spent wandering. Yeah, this is how people die in blizzards, by the way. You get lost, you can't find shelter, you freeze to death. Uh, guys? There's something over there! Diego points at a strangely welcoming building in the distance. A sign half buried in the snow reads, Elysian Lodge Resort. Another resort? All the way up here? Some people like to ski, Sean. We're saved! Sure we are. Or so one would hope. All right. Finally, more genre savvy. Take a drink. This has been a very low drinking night. Okay, so that was chapter nine. We found both clues in the chapter as well as the catalyst idol. We are well on our way to completing the set. What happens then? Who knows? Do we bring about the end of the world? Probably. So, as usual, we can restart the chapter or continue on. I... I'm gonna call it a night. It's... It's real. Um, so I will pick this back up next Friday. So, same time, same place twitch.tv slash aromanticace at 7 p.m. Pacific for more Endless Friday, where we will find out how we're inevitably going to die in the Overlook Hotel. I mean the Elysian Lodge Resort. Are there creepy twins walking around the halls? Is there a naked dead woman in a bathtub somewhere? Probably. Tune in! Uh, <laughs> you can also tune in on... 
uh, Monday for more Perfect Match Monday, where we are playing Perfect Match 2. So also, uh, same time, same place, twitch.tv slash aromanticace at 7 p.m. Pacific, where... What are we doing? What are we doing? Oh, right. We, we are probably about to hear about the Siren Project from, from Khan. That's what we're doing. So what, what on earth does that entail? You can find out on Monday. Until then, enjoy whatever it is you do between now and Monday. Catch you later.